Um, in this talk, basically, I'm going to share with you why I think Dapper is uh, the best complement to Kubernetes uh, for developers. Uh, so who am I? I am a former consultant architect uh, from Red Hat, where I worked on middleware technologies with projects such as Apache Camel, messaging, uh, business processes, uh, and Kubernetes. And what I love doing is, uh, while working on these projects, also collect um, use cases, best practices, patterns, and share, share those uh, through blog posts, uh, talks, and books. So if you want, you can go to this URL and get a free copy of uh, my book, Kubernetes Patterns, or on Thursday, uh, if you are around at the Red Hat booth, there will be book signing, so you can get a printed copy uh, if you're interested. Uh, so I, I think uh, almost, uh, everything we do in IT probably can be uh, uh, categorized in one of these categories. So it's either for increasing revenue, you know, decreasing cost, or mitigating risk. And there are different ways to address that. I picked here, for, uh, for example, uh, maybe you can focus on innovation. You know, use some open source libraries to do machine learning, data science, and increase your revenue by bringing new customers. Or you may be focusing on having shorter release cycles with smaller deployment units uh, to do innovation that way or increase your agility or to, uh, become more efficient by introducing uh, automation and using more SaaS services rather than implementing everything yourself. But whatever are your strategies, I think there are consequences. For example, if you start uh, doing more data science, machine learning, you may find out that most open source libraries are in Python, and now you have to add another language in your organization. You will have to uh, manage multiple heterogeneous applications, you know, microservices, uh, monoliths, and others, and you will have to do those uh, on your data center and maybe one or more multiple cloud. And uh, I think that is uh, bringing technology proliferation in your organization, uh, proliferation in multiple dimensions that's happening at the same time. And that proliferation is impacting different teams uh, in different ways. Um, for example, your uh, data science team might be using Python, but your ops team, they, ha and they have to serve uh, multiple teams and they have to you know, find a way to uh, package, distribute applications within different languages. Then they have to find, operate uh, these applications and even provision infrastructure in multiple clouds. So, uh, while the challenges for ops team and platform teams is around consistency, the challenges for developers are more around uh, uh, productivity. Uh, so what can happen there is, for example, you may have some teams that are using languages or frameworks which are better suited for creating cloud native applications, whereas the others are not. Uh, and that uh, uh, creates silos within the organization. Now, what's the answer for this? I think the answer is to use technologies that help address these challenges in multiple dimensions, basically use cloud native technologies that are you know, cloud native by design and not repurposed afterwards. Um, to find uh, those, I've looked at the CNCF projects and to see how the different CNCF projects help. Basically, I map the software development lifecycle and roughly where the focus of developers are and where the focus of ops is. And I put on that graph basically the graduated CNCF projects and you can see that the primary focus there is uh, not surprisingly not on writing implementing applications but for operating the applications. Uh, then I went forward and added the incubating projects and the trend become actually stronger. You can see there is even more focus on uh, releasing, deploying application, opera applications, operating, monitoring them. Uh, and, and the good news is there are now also projects that are focused for developers uh, and help developers actually implement those applications, such as Dapper. Um, and here, for example, uh, the challenges I mentioned earlier, I think containers, uh, whether those are you know, Docker, container D, uh, they help you package polyglot applications uh, um, in a unified format. Then Kubernetes helps you operate those applications and projects such as Crossplane, they can help you provision the infrastructure you need on multiple clouds. So these are addressing the needs of the ops and Dapper is addressing the needs of developer in these three dimensions. So next, I will look into 
uh, three use cases and see why, and explain why Dapper is good complement to Kubernetes. Um, so here I have uh, a distributed application represented by the two containers. In reality, probably you have hundreds and thousands of those, and you have to you know, run them on top of the infrastructure. And today, the most popular way to do that is, at least on this conference, that's Kubernetes and the Kubernetes API. Um, and the Kubernetes API does that by using containers for resource isolation and uh, uh, resource constraints. It is using the pod abstraction uh, with lifecycle guarantees. Uh, it's uh, offering health checks that make sure your application is, uh, your process is always up and running. You know, there is uh, automatic deployments, rollbacks, uh, placement, and even uh, uh, auto-scaling. Uh, but all, the, uh, all of these capabilities basically help um, ops people to deploy and operate large uh, scale application. So what's in it for developers? Uh, we can say there is a service discovery in uh, Kubernetes and there is a config map in secret and, pretty, and that's pretty much it. There is nothing to do ser reliable service invocation, pub sub, uh, and this is where Dapper uh, comes in. Dapper uh, addresses these limitations uh, by offering us reliable service invocation, pops up, uh, resiliency policies, you know, more advanced configuration management, secret management, etc. So it's giving the productivity to developers, uh, uh, whereas Kubernetes is giving you know that productivity to ops people. So that's the uh, first use case. Uh, Looking at the second one, so again we have the, our distributed application uh, that Kubernetes is really good uh, to run, uh, but then these distributed applications, typically they don't only depend on each other, they also depend on uh, external services, such as relational databases, stuff that you wouldn't run on Kubernetes. You know, document store, key value store, message queue, and uh, the chance that if you are using Kubernetes, you know, to manage uh, these own cluster applications, you probably have, imp uh, you are probably used to, uh, use YAML for defining the desired state of resources and you have processes and tools in place such as you know, GitOps. And today there are many pro, uh, projects that allows you to use uh, Kubernetes to manage these external resources such as Crossplane or some cloud specific uh, providers such as uh, AWS controller for Kubernetes, Azure uh, service operator and GCP config connector. So they all allow you to define custom resource definitions on Kubernetes, uh, but this custom resource definition control resources outside of your cluster. Uh, now, uh, but I would say this is only again half of the story. It allows operations um, teams to manage external resources, but how can then developer use those resources? And this is where again, uh, I think Dapper comes. Uh, with Dapper bindings and actually with the other um, APIs such as you know PubSub, State Store, Secret Store, you can connect to these exter external resources and consume them from your application, um, and, and you can do that in a consistent way. Uh, but what I mean by that is you can apply the resiliency policies we heard today not only to your service invocation, but you can apply them onto those bindings, and you can get observability and tracing, uh, uh, etc. So that gives you. Uh, the ops people uh, ability to define a single, to use the Kubernetes API as a single source of truth for defining the state of the application and also the state of the external uh, resources. And Dapper lets you consume those resources. Um, so that's the uh, second scenario. And then on the third one, um, so we have you know applications running on Kubernetes, we have external resources, but more and more often we see uh, that applications have to run on multiple clusters, whether it be, uh, that's on you know, multiple data centers, data center and a cloud, uh, um, et cetera. And you may, you may need that for different reasons, maybe because you have to scale your applications or you have to do it for uh, reasons to isolate different workloads uh, uh, or for data locality reasons when an application have to run on a specific a region or, or a cloud. Um, and typically there would be a global control plane where you can deploy applications, but what is happening there is 
again, we see the Kubernetes API used uh, uh, in this scenario. So projects such as Google Antos, Red Hat, Advanced Cluster Manager, uh, Azure Arc, even you know, Hypersheet, uh, KCP, these are all projects that offer you a Kubernetes API at, uh, as a global control plane that you can use deploy your application on remote Kubernetes clusters. Uh, this way you can use the same uh, uh, consistency and compliance practices you have to deploy applications uh, on multiple, uh, on the remote uh, clusters. Uh, what else you get in this scenario? So you can apply, you know, policies, global policies that apply to multiple workloads. You get a single um, unified view of, uh, of all your workloads, uh, et cetera. And I think in this scenario, what Dapper can bring uh, into the picture are a few things. First, that will give you cloud independent uh, distributed uh, primitives. Uh, to give you an example, if you want to create an event driven application on Azure, you have to use uh, Azure Event Grid. On GCP, it's a, a GCP event arc. On, Azam, uh, on Amazon, it's Event Bridge. So these are three different event driven you know, services that let you create similar application, but they all have different you know, primitives, different tools, processes. With Dapper, you can create applications using Dapper primitives and uh, be sure that these primitives will plug into, the, uh, into these cloud services and you can have an application that's portable, it's been developed and tested uh, in, uh, in a unified way. So that's one. Uh, the second thing Dapper would give to ops uh, personnel is the uh, ability to uh, get enhanced observability, the ability to have you know, policies that you can apply, apply across different data centers and clouds. Um, even, even with the sidecar, you get an isolation of the technical constraints, which means you can upgrade your sidecar you know, easily. It also gives a boundary for any potential supply chain security risks, uh, et cetera. Um, and of course, you can have a global uh, control plane for Dapper and uh, that can give you, you know, a global view of your old Dapper applications where you can enforce policies, best practices. That, that's something that we've, we've been working on recently. Uh, so this is how Dapper can help and complement Kubernetes in this scenario. Um, so uh, summing up, so, uh, so Kubernetes can manage applications on a cluster. It can manage on multiple clusters uh, or manage external resources. And I would say Dapper helps you, you know, create and implement reliable applications uh, that run on these clusters or consume these external resources in an efficient way. Uh, we didn't even touch on the platform engineering, but Yaron did that earlier. Uh, and we see also uh, that Dapper helps platform engineering here in, to create you know, a consist consistent developer uh, experience. Mm. What about the flywheel effect? Uh, I think if we look at the uh, Kubernetes API, um, you know, it's declarative, uh, idempotent, you know, based on YAML. Uh, it's extensible, so that you can use custom resource definitions, you can use uh, operators to add new capabilities. It is highly scalable through its asynchronous re uh, reconciliation process. And I think these are characteristics that made Kubernetes today ubiquitous for running any kind of workload whether that's on cluster, you know, off cluster, multiple clusters, et cetera. Um, similarly, I think if you look into Dapper API, uh, it is based on HTTP and gRPC, so it is uh, API driven, uh, it is polyglot. Uh, it is extensible, uh, so there are more and more new building blocks that being added, so there are new capabilities added. There are new components, so new implementations that are uh, added and it's non-intrusive. So you can use it with microservices, but also with brownfield applications, uh, et cetera. And I think these are characteristics that can give Dapper enough critical mass to make Dapper ubiquitous among developers, um, the same way Kubernetes is among uh, uh, operations. And that's it. Thank you. That's it.